What is going on guys? Dude, Yumiko here. And today we're back with some more Katoa Shoujo. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry that I've been away for so long. A lot of things have been happening just to kind of catch you up. Uh, I did take like an eight day long trip to Illinois to visit some friends up there. So that's why I've been gone. And I was trying to get a video out yesterday, but I was very, very sick. So I couldn't do that. I'm still not feeling 100% right now, but... I want to get a video out to you guys, so I'm going to muster it up and uh, try and pump this out. So, it has been a while since we've played Katoa Shoujo, I believe last time we left off. Um, oh, what happened, man? I think I think Lily had actually like just left the airport or something along such lines. Anyways, we're not going to try and figure this out and make a fool of myself. We're just going to jump right on back into it. Ah, The snap of my mobile phone's closing contrasts with the ambient chatter and noise audible even in the hallway outside the library. It's the first day of the summer holidays, a time that had perpetually seemed so far away, and yet it's now not only here, but also made painfully obvious by the students, or lack thereof, left in the school. Most students have returned home to spend the holidays with relatives by now. The few that are left are mostly chatting between themselves, usually about what they intend to do in the coming weeks. It makes me feel like the odd one out, for taking advantage of the school library being open for the first several days of the holidays. Ostensibly, it's for students to drop off any books they've borrowed and, yet, and have yet to return, and for those who will have their parents pick them up, to help pass the time until they get whisked away. Thanks to the recent lengthy phone call from my parents, which had so rudely woken me from my sleeping on a beanbag at the back of the library, I'm now in the latter category. Sliding my phone back into my pocket, this time remembering to set it silent, I go back into the quiet and holy placid room. It's a nostalgic sight. Just as when Lily first led me to the library, the orange tint of sunset bathes the room in its light, while Hanako sits on a beanbag, silently reading, and Yuko fusses, just barely visible behind the counter. Hanako especially has been noticeably, noticeably more quiet than usual since yesterday's happenings, but I can't really blame her. It wasn't just me that depended on that person after all. I quietly walk back to the beanbag near her where I'd sat before, being doubly careful not to make any unnecessary noise. The soft puff it gives as the bag takes my weight makes Hanako's eyes flick towards me, but only for a second. Oh yeah, I remember now. Lily had basically told us, like, Look, I'm probably gonna go back to Scotland to live with my parents, and I'll probably never see you again. Bye. That's what happened. Alright, we're back on track. Rather, she seems more thoughtful and measured than I expected, perhaps due to her desire of working out how to deal with Lily's leaving, rather than just being depressed over it. It makes me a little proud of her. Hey, Hanako. Y yeah Still going ahead with your idea of traveling? She gives a determined nod. I'll be starting in a day or two, and Naomi's decided to come with me too. Wow, quick start. Where are you two headed to first? I think we're going to start by going north, then loop down and go southward. So, Hokkaido's going to be first? <clears throat> well, that's so awkward. <laughs> she gives another nod, more tentative than the last. The significance of that place is not lost on either of us. Do you know how you're going to handle the traveling expenses and accommodations? Yeah, I've worked everything out. I should be okay. Naomi says she has her side worked out too. You know that if you need anything, you can just call, right? I gave you my number before. Any time of the day is fine. She gives me a smile, which in itself feels like a small personal victory. I know. Th thanks, Hisao. Maybe Lily was right. Although I may offer Hanako any help I can possibly give, I feel as if I know she doesn't need it. She really has grown. Hanago's plans for her holidays are in sharp contrast to my simple following of my parents' suggestions to stay with them. Holidays had always made me feel less excited than most, though, so maybe this is just a return to the status quo. Before my heart attack, I'd always lived so aimlessly that holidays weren't all that much different from my everyday life anyway. After school, I'd wander around a bit in the city, often hanging out with some friends, before making my way home to eat dinner with usually one of my parents, but rarely both. Their work schedules didn't leave much time for them to be home, and going there straight from school would have just meant I'd end up feeling bored. I was an urban I was an urban knight though, through and through. Since coming to Yamaku though, it feels like I fundamentally changed as a person. 
The phone call with my parents erased any traces of doubt that I might have held on to that in any case. While before I had exercised a fairly normal level of independence for a teenager, that being not a whole lot, my parents were more than pleased to hear of my newfound ability in taking care of myself. Laundry, cooking for myself, cleaning, all in addition to other general choices that came from living without parents around. Just little menial things I've had to pick up, but with relative ease. When I think about it, I'd always depended on them, even if they hadn't been at home all the time. To say I never depended on anyone after moving to Yamaku dormitories would be far from the truth, though. Um, excuse me? The two of us look up at the awkwardly fidgeting figure in front of us. Some things never change. It's getting close to closing time, so, um... Oh, right. I'd forgotten that the library closes earlier during the holidays. Hanako and I both get up and dust ourselves off placing our books back on the shelf behind us. The fact that our taste and reading material have a fair amount of overlap is useful at times. With a bow to Yuko to apologize for taking so much time, Hanako takes her leave of us. See you tomorrow, Hisao. Bye. And with that, she walks out of the large, wooden, aging doors that herald the entrance to the library. She's a quiet person, isn't she? I so suppose I should be surprised at a staff member sharing personal opinions like this, but after knowing Yuko for a while, it's largely expected. Our relationship is more personal, rather than one with her acting as an authority figure. Yeah, I think that's just how she is. She's got a lot more confidence in herself these days, though. I don't know her as well as you two, but I think I agree. It's nice to see her talking to people here. She never used to do that before. Hey, Yuko. You know about Lily's leaving, right? She told me herself a few days ago. It must be hard leaving everyone behind like she is. She quickly looks back to me after she says this, probably remembering that I went to her for advice on the relationship between Lily and me before. Are you going to be okay? That's a difficult question. It's something I'd rather not think about for now, though, given more present. Ugh. It's something I'd rather not think about now, though, given more pre given more pressing issues. Fuck! I can't read. Something seems kind of off about this whole deal, don't you think? Yuko appears to think for a while, absent-mindedly scrunching her face up in a variety of creative ways as she does so. I don't think I really know her well enough to make that kind of judgment. I'm sorry I can't be more help. No, that's fine. I'm just sort of thinking out loud. I give a deep sigh and scratch my head in frustration. It's just so much stuff happening at once that I have no control over. It feels like I'm being swamped. I think everyone goes through times like that. What's important is to concentrate on what you can do, rather than what you can't do. At least that's how I see it. If I didn't think like that, I don't think I'd be able to manage my life as it is. She says it with a smile and a light tone, but her words are far from any kind of joke. Being pulled between two jobs as she is, just to hopefully make enough money not only to live, but also for university, must be exhausting. Perhaps that's why, coming from her, this feels like it has more meaning than if it had come from most others. I guess you got a point there. Thank you for your advice once again, Yuko. She bows deeply and smiles again, before making her way back over to the counter where she spends so much of her time. The tiny wings of the cardboard crane in my fingers are only just visible in the dim light of my room, just a little of the moonlight being able to peek through the curtains and around their edges. I lie still in my dark bed for a long time, idly looking up at the little origami bird. It feels like a lot's happened since Lily folded this, but at the same time it feels like very little has changed. Compared to everyone else, I'm back to square one. I might have a newfound idea of where I want to go in life. That's hardly something that affects me now. Hanako changed, I know that much. If anything, she just makes me feel like I've got no excuse to be like this, considering her previous situation. Lily, though. I turn the bird in my fingers another way, looking at it from yet another angle. When I first met her, she seemed aloof and perhaps somewhat distant. Her actions were always careful, measured and precise and her carefully maintained composure always gave the appearance of unerring confidence and serenity. In time, she became less formal. Just a bit, but enough. It felt good to see her lowering her inhibitions around me, and opening up, even just a little, of her own accord. 
I felt as if I was seeing her real self slowly become more vibrant and visible. Now, though, I'm beginning to have doubts. Perhaps they're to be expected after what is, effectively, the two of us breaking up. They don't feel new or strange, though, but rather like an old book being found and dusted off. I soon realized after meeting Lily that she saw me as she did Hanako, as someone who needed help and care. At first, I, su I simply thought that we'd be fine as friends, helping each other through our limited time together in school. But then I began to treasure our moments together more and more, from our quiet walks to talking over lunch. The good sides of her personality became ever more obvious, and ever more likable. The absence caused by Lily's trip to Scotland to visit her long-distant family and sick aunt only made me realize how much I liked just being around her, but I thought that she felt a similar way. For her, though, maybe that wasn't everything to our relationship. Even after she returned to Japan, that just meant she lost her family once again after meeting them for such a brief time. She lived so much of her life without her family around, not to mention with Akita working long hours, that she had little choice but to be like that. I thought her sense of independence to be a good and admirable trait. It was in stark difference to my reliance on my parents before my heart attack, as reluctant as I may have been to admit it. However, it also meant that she never let people get too close to her. She lost her family, likely due to her blindness, went to a different school from anybody she knew because of it, and worked all the harder to make sure she didn't end up a burden on her sister and those around her. And now, Akita's going to Inverness, just like the family she thought she'd lost. She never told me of her plans, as conflicted as she was about them. Lily didn't want to be a burden on anyone, including me. I'm an idiot. I never questioned it. I never tried to be there or ask when she needed me to. I just set my life up and expected it to stay that way forever, with the two of us having a nice long relationship where we pushed forwards towards our future together. A small pit of frustration and anger at myself wells up in my chest. I just let everything happen, never even trying to help Lily. Just her being there was enough. I thought I'd keep going on if going on if that were true. But that could never have been enough. It was a childlike independence on somebody, without any attempt to understand or help their situation. Thanks to that, I lost Lily. I lost the one person I loved most, because I wasn't there for her when she needed me. With an increasingly angry feeling washing over me, I turn over and set the crane back on my desk to my, next to my clock, the place where it has lived since that day when she folded it for me. Since that day when she herself said my burdens need to be my own. The obnoxious bright red numerals of my alarm clock shine through the darkness of the room into my tired eyes. Ten o'clock. Evening. Curfew will be soon. I wonder. I could imagine they'd be leaving this evening. I have no idea exactly when their flight is, but that means there's a chance, however small, that they might not have already left. Adrenaline starts moving through my body as I sit up on my bed, my eyes suddenly wide with possibility. There's no guarantee they haven't left. Indeed, it's likely that they already have, but there's also a chance they haven't, however small it might be. Just as once. Just as I should have before. I stand up and rush over to my cabinet throwing out some clothes as fast as I can and sliding them on in quick succession. Each second that goes by is a second that I can't regain, a second that may mean the difference between catching them and losing them forever. Even if I fail, I have to try. I can't let her leave everything behind without even trying to stop her, without just this once being there for her. With the last of my clothes slipped on, I hastily grab the phone off the desk. Luckily, the number for a local taxi company is still in my call history. A gruff, unenthusiastic voice announces the name of the company while I pace around the room. It takes some effort to slow down my voice and keep it clear over the phone. The chilly night air sweeps against me as I open the dormitory door, but nevertheless, I keep up my brisk speed as I half jog, half run, out, out to the school gates. It may not be curfew just yet, but it's precariously close. If there were a guard around, they'd no doubt have some questions for me, but it looks like I've managed to come out just before they arrive, or they're around the corner. My pace picks up as I make my way through the school gardens, their nighttime allure all but lost when I begin to run to the school gate. The lamps of the courtyard, dim as they are, provide just enough illumination to light the way and prevent me from tripping over. The buildings themselves take on a rustic, almost antique-looking edge when I glance at them. Looking back, it seems strange that they once appeared so dark and looming to me. Now they just look to be somewhat anach anachronistic school buildings. <laughs> 
the same as any others bar their age. Leaving the gates behind me, I pull up to a stop just before the taxi, parked just as Akira's car had been. Its gaudy and brightly lit sign looks out of place in the quiet country backdrop. I impatiently squeeze myself through the door, giving the driver the address for where the two should hopefully be staying. By the time the taxi pulls up at the maddeningly, at maddeningly casual speed, it's well and truly deep into the night. The house is truly enormous, its sheer size much larger than I'd expected, and ominously still. Fearing the worst, I ask the driver to stay just in case my efforts are for naught. A single press from the fancy intercom system outside the gate produces a short, electronic melody in the otherwise silent road. It's not long before a somewhat deep, gruff voice can be heard from it. This is the Hakamachi residence. Please state your name and why you're bothering us this late. I press on, despite inwardly wincing at the reasonable annoyance audible in his voice. It's Hisana Kai. I was hoping to meet Lily or Akira if they're still here. Surprisingly, I managed to summon quite some energy to my voice, enough to make the other side of the intercom silent. A few seconds pass, but just before I press the button again and ask what's going on, a light turns on outside the front door. I strain my eyes to try and make out who's coming through, but as he comes past a large parked car with fishing rods sticking out the back, his identity becomes clear. His face is typically placid and emotionless as he saunters up to the gate. He's still childlike in his mannerisms, despite his demeanor. With a press of a few buttons from behind the fence, the gate slowly opens. Oh, it's this motherfucker. Hey, Sal, what are you doing here? I think this is the most emotion I've ever heard from his voice. Not that it would be hard to reach that mark. Akira told me that she and Lily would be staying here before they left for their flight. I need to talk to Lily. Just one last time. Are they still here? The look on his face says everything. I failed. I was too late. The one time when I actually needed to act quickly and... Actually, it's possible. What? What is? He's a bit taken aback by my fervor, but I can't help it at this point. They left not long ago, only a few minutes before you arrived, in fact. If you go straight to the airport, you might be able to- Isao? I dart back towards the waiting, the ta the waiting taxi, grabbing what little money is left in my pocket as I go. Thanks, Hiraiki! With that, I take a seat, and in short order, bark out my destination. My chest beats wildly as I tear down the street my body twisting this way and that to slip between the pedestrians walking back and forth beside me. With the road solidly blocked by taxis and other cars, dropping off passengers and picking up others in the time they have to wait, we ended up having to stop almost a block away. But that's in the past now. What matters is reaching Lily. One foot hits the ground, the other quickly following without the slightest thought, as if my legs have taken on a life of their own and all my mind can do is concentrate on the view ahead of me. Just one glimpse of that long hair of hers. That long yellow hair that was the same color as the wheat that stretched as far as the eye could see. In the end, I depended on Lily, just like Hanako did. Even after we started going out, it still didn't feel still doesn't feel like she really ever let herself depend on me. Except for one moment. That one moment where we held each other tightly on that bright yellow field. At that time she must have feared losing me, just as she did everyone else. That's why just this once. The night air wraps around me draining every last remnant of warmth out of my body, to the extent that it feels more like midwinter than a summer night. My fingers, my hands, my feet, they all feel increasingly cold. The sound of the passing crowds is reduced to nothing more than a background hum while the sound of my shoes hitting the pavement echoes loudly, every step surging towards the person I have to catch. Forced by my chest tightening in response to the cold every night, I rest an arm over it to try and settle it down. When the airport comes into view, though, I realize this feeling is one that I've felt before. Not now. Of all times for this, please not now. I take a gulp and soldier on regardless, pushing my body as far as it will go. Sweat pours off me as I hurtle forward, my shoulder hitting someone's side and my mind suddenly flooding with emotions and memories. I continue on without an apology. I have to keep moving now. If, I'm stop, if I stop, I'm not sure I could begin again. And if I could do it, and if I could, it would all be for naught if I'm not in time. I hit another person, then another, offering little resistance to getting bounced about. My feet feel numb. My arms are losing all feeling. My chest forces me to hunch over awkwardly, tightening even more. That afternoon, in the snow, that time when my life irreversibly changed, images of Iwanako and that damned letter flash over and over in my mind. 
the first love I'd lost thanks to my condition. I can't let that happen again. I don't care what happens to me anymore, I just need to see her one last time. There! A sliver of yellow and white comes into view some distance down the road, her figure silhouetted by the lights emanating from the airport entrance. Lily! Lily! Lily, stop, please! Lily! Come on, Lily. I know your hearing's far beyond nor- Gah! My view suddenly spins out of control and ends up on the ground. My body haphazardly sprawled after hitting someone and stumbling over. Before I can assess the damage, an unbelievable pain ignites in my body. All my thoughts are blank as I curl up and frantically clutch at my chest. Hey, are you okay? That was a really bad fall. This pain. I can't. Any sharp knock could do me in. Any overexertion. I thought I could overcome my limits this once. Something's wrong with him! What's the matter? Are... The voices of those gathering around me are gradually replaced by a loud ringing in my ears. By now I'm unable to move my head. My eyes turn upwards to see the mute moving of their lips. Even as I clutch my chest, I realize I can't feel my fingers anymore, nor my feet. It feels like my entire body is shutting down, starting from the extremities. With one last effort, I turn my head down the road towards the airport entrance that's casting its light over me. Lily's there, behind the crowd. Her head is tilted, but only just slightly. I can feel my vision dimming as I try to yell out, but nothing emerges from my mouth despite my best efforts. Slowly but surely, my vision begins to black out the scene before me. So, this is how it ends. I failed. I was so close. So very close. But at the very last moment, my condition seized my chance at a new life and dragged me back. Now I'm going to die. Sprawled out just meters from an airport, with a crowd of babbling people surrounding me, and with Lily leaving for Scotland just a little distance ahead. L that last word extinguishes the last of my energy. The world falls into a deep, inescapable blackness as every muscle in my body shuts down. I'm sorry, Lily. I was too late. Damn, my boy! <laughs> no! Come on, dude. No way, like, we're obviously not gonna die, but goddamn. What's going on? As I slowly open my eyes, a bright white light assaults my retinas. For a minute, I just lay where I am, mindlessly staring ahead while my scattered thoughts coalesce in my slowly waking mind. Slowly but surely, the white begins to come into, my, come into focus as a bare expanse begins to be drawn across my field of vision. It's only when the light fixture comes into view that my mind clicks that this is the ceiling above me. Slowly levering myself up, I silently absorb through all my senses the details of the room I'm in. The smell and taste of strong bleach hanging in the air, blending the impression of a place just slightly too clean to be natural. Inoffensive, pale, peach-colored walls, all perfectly painted without a crack, stain, or imperfection. A single framed painting hangs on the wall, perfectly straightened. Like the walls, it's as boring and, inoffens and inoffensive as can be. My attention's grabbed by the translucent curtain waving across my vision, my eyes following it to the open window it covers. When I move my right arm to try to lift myself up and look through it, I can feel the cathedral dig in uncomfortably. It's only now, too, that I notice the canula tube is winding around my cheeks and into my nose. After some fidgeting, I settle for just looking around the corner of the window. Beyond the thick leaves of several large trees, I can see the greenery below, backing out into a field, a customary island of green on the outskirts of the city. How far can I go back? Sorry, I just, I just, I just need to get this image. Okay, we're good, we're good, we're good. We are good, we are good, we are good. And we go all the way back. Judging by the sun outside, it's noon. Of which day, though, I'm not sure. So, I'm in the hospital once again. I let out a long, tired breath as I try to recollect my scattered thoughts, 
my mind seemingly cast in a dozen directions all at once with as many emotions running through me. After slowly lying back down, I decide to start at the beginning, why I'm here. I cast my mind back, but I can't work out a smooth recollection of what happened. The events of last night, or whichever night it was, come back more as a series of snapshots than any cohesive memory. Lying on my bed looking at the origami bird. Talking to Hiraeki outside the Hakamaichi residence. Running down the street, passing pedestrians and bumping into more and more of them. Falling. Looking up at the serene, serenely bright airport entrance, seeing Lily's back as I lay on the ground. The silence of the private room suddenly feels overwhelming. So that's it. I had my chance to correct my mistake and I blew it. Whether I was at fault for neglecting my medication and disregarding to pace myself, or my body was giving out so soon, it doesn't matter now. All that matters is that, once again, I'm alone. The pastel blue pillow yields with little resistance as I let myself fall back onto the bed, its starchy case, along with the starchy sheets, providing little comfort. Compared to the darkness of last night's events, the bright light of the room around me is striking. All it does, though, is emphasize how otherworldly places like this are. Arrhythmia. A strange word. A foreign, alien one. One that you don't want to be in the same room with. A rare condition. It causes the heart to act erratically and occasionally beat way too fast. It can be fatal. It was a miracle that you were able to go on so long without anything happening, they said. And then it did. My condition had taken everything away from me. My old school was of no importance anymore. My home was reduced to a faraway place. Both my friends and my first love simply stopped visiting after a length of time. I became cynical and embittered, distant and subdued. In my defense, no person could avoid that after such a thing happening to them. But nonetheless, I left the hospital as a very definitely changed person. Things changed. I made new friends in Hanako. She's an A and Misha. I've had a new sense of home in my dormitory. A new interest in science and the world around me. And I found a direction to my life that I had never felt before. But I'd also discovered other things. The sense of isolation Yamaku and its surroundings was not entirely unwelcome. The quiet gave me a peace of mind that I might not have found elsewhere. But it gave the area a feeling of being pushed out of the way. Of being kept out of sight. People in the streets would sometimes glance awkwardly or quickly turn their heads as they realized they were staring. Even if my condition wasn't visible, my uniform was. Even if it weren't, I was still different. I took 17 pills a day, morning, midday, and night. My scar, though hidden behind my clothing, was still a permanent mark of my condition. And most of all, there was the very real possibility of death. A bad fall, an absent-minded hard hit on the back, a simple sprint taken too far, anything could set my heart off. And several times I teetered on the edge of the abyss, even with all the care I took of myself. But that was fine. I could have lived with all that. Because there was one final thing that I found, or rather, refound, after Anton Yamako, which was once again snatched away before my eyes. It's only now that I realize just how delicate my newfound sense of happiness was. Everything depended on her. The linchpin of my life since I entered, first entered Yamaku as a sullen, confused, and aimless transfer student. Lily Sato was the only person I could depend upon above all others and she reciprocated the love that I felt for her. But I failed her, and only realized it all too late. I thought that I could just set myself up and continue that way forever, but the real world doesn't work like that. I finally realized the meaning of those words only to be struck down as I confronted my failure to do so in time. The surroundings I'm now in are all too familiar. It's as if Yamaku was but a dream, and I'm still recovering from my first major heart attack. Maybe that's why I feel so tired. It feels almost as if, I, as if I lived the entire last few months of my life in the space of minutes. The weight of my eyelids closes my eyes, my physical and mental exhaustion letting me offer no resistance. Unintelligible mumbling from the head of the bed stirs me out of my sleep. With my eyes still closed, I can focus and make out someone, presumably a nurse, bidding farewell to a doctor. As I open my eyes, I notice the door closing in my peripheral vision. The doctor stands reading some notes off a clipboard held in his hand, carefully looking over the pages. 
After consulting his obviously very important documents, he looks up and notices my gaze. It's now that I notice something slightly odd about his expression and general disposition, but I can't quite put my finger on it. Ah, I see you're awake, Mr. Nakai. His quick glance to my bed end to verify my name shows that his documents obviously didn't have it written on them. I must admit, this is a bit unfortunate. Your parents visited earlier while you were asleep. I could notify them you're awake now if you'd like. Um, thanks. That would be good. I give a somewhat dazed reply, most likely the one he'd expect, before really thinking about what I'm saying. Not a problem. And if you have any questions you'd like to ask, I'll be happy to answer them. That is, unless you'd prefer to rest. The anesthetic's still going to be affecting you a bit, I'm afraid. The anesthetic? Of course. That's why I felt so strange the first time I woke up. I slowly shake my head, not wanting to dislodge any pipes or cause myself any more discomfort than necessary. The doctor politely puts down his clipboard in response. I guess my main question is, what exactly happened? To put it simply, you've unfortunately had another heart attack. While not as severe as your first, you were very lucky it occurred so close to a hospital. After being stabilized, you were taken to the operating room. What followed was keyhole surgery in order to insert a temporary pacemaker. All in all, the incident happened two days ago, with emergency treatment being carried out very soon afterwards. Since then, we've kept you under close observation while you were asleep. Will I be alright? Are there any lasting problems? Compared to the procedure carried out for your first heart attack, this was relatively minor. While you will have to undergo surgery once more in a few days, time to remove in a few days' time to remove the pacemaker, assuming there are no more complications, there should be no lasting implications. He continued talking, the subject shifting to a repetition of facts about arrhythmia on my medications that I already know for the most part. I start to nod and feign interest while my mind drifts. I begin to think about how perfectly hung the inoffensive painting hanging on the wall behind his shoulder is, and how neat and sterile the surroundings are, even including the doctor himself. If my mumbling bores you, you are quite welcome to say so, Mr. Nakai. Lord knows I lose track of myself sometimes. He gives a short chuckle at his self-deprecating joke as I grimace awkwardly, having been ra rather badly called out. The doctor's chuckle sounds different from the way from that of the nurse at Yamaku, though, come to think of it. As I ponder why, I realize the man in front of me feels just that little bit off. His smile is neat and sterile. He delivers his little joke perfectly with the customary inoffensive chuckle. It's like, rather than talking to a man whose name is duly printed on the name tag pinned to his lab coat, and merely interacting with an actor reading off a pre-rehearsed script, every action having been choreographed beforehand. I suppose he has to be that way though, being a doctor. He has to keep his neat and sterile smile when chatting to the girl with cancer. <laughs> Fuck. Cancer is slowly starting, spreading through her body, when reassuring the woman who will surely die from childbirth and with every other terminally ill and critically ill patient. With that little bit of distance, that little bit of aloofness, it makes me wonder if I've been too harsh, especially considering it's a disposition far, far from being adopted only by people in his profession. After all, the only one I loved kept that same distance from others herself. Looking up to the doctor again, I realize I've been in thought with my head bowed for some time. I understand you must still be tired. You've been through a lot, and as I mentioned before, the anesthetic would still be affecting you. If you don't mind, I'll let you get some rest and tell your parents you've woken up for you. I think that would be good. Thank you. He gives a curt nod before picking up his clipboard and making his way to the large white door in the corner of the room, closing it behind him with a thud. In the end, I'm alone again. Lily's gone. Aki is gone. Hanukkah would be traveling. And even my parents have already left the hospital. Four pale peach walls, one white ceiling, and a single open window to look out towards the world outside. It's hard to think of a future where the, the past is crowded around you, claustrophobic in its neat, sterile, starchy, bleach-smelling grip. Lost for what to do or focus on, I content myself with sleeping the time away as if this were just another dream like Yamaku had been. White. A sterile, clean white for a sterile, clean room. My eyes open, then I simply stare at the ceiling for some time. It's about as interesting as a television would be, mounted on its metal rack, hanging off the ceiling above the head. Bed. Indeed, the television saw its entire use during my t the time my parents were here, left on quietly as they waited for me to wake. It was about as banal as it had been the first time I'd ended up in the hospital. 
Earlier today, an attending nurse had offered to turn off the EKG speakers. I refused simply because the sound is so entirely normal to me now. It's almost comforting in a way. The metronome-like regularity gives at least some feeling that time is moving, even in a place such as this. After some time of listening to its beeping while I fully awaken, though, I realize there's another sound in the room. Concentrating all my efforts on listening, a task made rather easy by the lack of distractions, a tiny, tinny melody can be heard. Light and quiet, the music sounds almost fragile as it is dwarfed by the EKG's pulses. Tilting my head just slightly to the side in an effort to see the source of the melody without dislodging any of the sensors and pipes stuck onto me, I notice a little wooden box sitting in the nightstand next to the bed. My mouth opens just slightly while I have silently watched the tiny yellow metal drum slowly rotate inside, the little bumps on its surface gradually moving in and out of sight. This music box, it's the one I gave. The creaking of the floorboard breaks me out of my reverie, my head and heart remaining still as my eyes turn to see who's coming through. Long tan skirt, peach off the shoulder sweater, pale, almost porcelain skin. Blue clouded eyes and long yellow hair. All I can do is stare as Lily slowly walks into the room, her fingers lightly running over the wall for orientation. My mind comes to a shuddering halt. L Lily? She stops mid stride, her entire body tensing. Hey, Sal, was that you? Her voice is quiet and pensive, echoing her expression. I thought that you were... Lily takes one tentative step forward, then another, as if she were holding herself back. Her control over her composure is for naught, though, and she finally rushes over to where I lay as the last of her resistance falls. Let's get that. I'm slightly taken aback when she grabs hold of me, hunching over as tears begin to fall from her cheeks. Since only minutes ago, I thought she was on the other side of the world. After a moment of hesitation, I rest my right arm on her hand. My right arm on her hand. Oh no, fuck. I rest my right hand on her soft shoulder. Isao! Isao! Lily's body trembles as her tears blot the pale green sheets, her emotions flooding through her carefully maintained exterior. With her face now closer, and made easier to see for her pale skin being lit by the sunlight from the window, I notice her cheeks being redder than they should be. It's okay, Lily. I'm okay. You don't need to... She writes herself quickly, her crying forcefully stifled with both sadness and stubbornness remaining in her moistened eyes. Her prideful nature, always having been something to contend with, takes me off guard. Stop telling me not to worry about you, Isao. Just this once, let me cry. I'm caught speechless. She waits for a response, but her composure breaks again after a handful of seconds. I swallow hard to try and settle my own emotions while she weeps onto my bed, a strange mixture of relief and depression welling up. Lily's here. She's really here. If I couldn't feel her skin under my hand, I'd hardly believe my own eyes. My efforts weren't for nothing. My body's attempt to take everything away that was important to me once again has been foiled. But now... I don't feel as happy about it as I thought I would. Seeing her here, crying like this over me, this is the one thing I'd wanted to avoid since coming to love her. No, I've been since leaving the hospital. I'm sorry, Lily. It's my fault that I'm here. I shouldn't have tried to push myself so far. I give a self-deprecating snort. After months of keeping myself together so nobody'd worry over me, I went and did something like this. I guess I'm pretty dumb. With a couple of sniffs and a long breath, Lily manages to pull herself together and calm down a little. Despite her red cheeks, moist eyes, and the lines of tears still visible, she delicately wears that weak smile she seems to so often give. You needn't blame yourself. I heard later that it happened as you were running down the road after me, right? Still. She wipes her eyes with the back of her hand, returning more to her old self as the rush of emotion wears off. Why did you run after me, Hissau? I move to respond, but notice her face tightening. Even after I'd said goodbye, and I left Yamaku Academy. She takes a moment to steady herself, her emotions almost bubbling up once again. 
I just wanted to say that I'm sorry. Sorry? For the times when I wasn't there when you needed me. Until now, I thought you were just... Until now, I thought you just being there would be enough. I only needed you by my side to make any day feel better. Even if my body may be like this, I want to help you, Lily. To be there when you need someone. You think you were always there, Hisao? Why did you want to go to Scotland, Lily? Why? I told you before. Because Aki was going and because of my family's summons to their home. Why didn't you say that you wanted to go? I... I'm not stubborn often. But this one time I think I need to be. I want you to stay here, Lily. I want you to stay where everyone you know lives. And where all your dreams and ambitions were made. If you choose to stay, I'll never leave your, si leave your side. I won't let you lose another person. When I had my heart attack, I was snatched away from everyone and everywhere I knew. You showed me a new life after I came to Yamaku. I'd lost my past, but you showed me a future. It's true that I haven't always been there for you. I'm unreliable. Sometimes I lied, and I thought I'd come to understand you when I hadn't even understood myself. Be that as it may, I want to give you a future as well. I want to be there for you. To share both your burdens and your happiness, just like I promised back in Hokkaido. I want you to trust me. I know I had problems coming to put my trust in you, after losing so many people I'd known after my heart attack. But that's how I know that being unable to trust others can feel awful. That's why I can't just watch you throw everything away like this. I never want you to go through what I did. I would do anything to stop that. You can be quite steadfast when you want to be, can't you? As I said, it isn't often. My weak smile drops, though, as the ivy in my arm digs in a little. It's a harsh reminder of my tether to my condition. Lily's face tenses as I let out a small gasp of pain, immediately making me wish I'd still a bit better. All I can do is sigh in relief. I try not to let everyone worry over me for the entire time since I left the hospital, but I can't even stop the one person I love the most from crying over me. Even if I might finally be able to put my feelings into words, I feel pretty useless with a body like this. Every time I tried to reach towards something, it was just snatched away. And even now, things only turned out for the better due to luck. I guess that's something else I should apologize for. All I can ever do is make you worry. Even now, there's very little chance I'll live anywhere near full life. The feeling of Lily's warm, soft hand moving over my left cheek makes me lift my head up. Her smile gentle and warm as she touches me. I think that is something very natural for you to say. You were always so sincere and self-conscious. You were always so reserved and mild-mannered, and patient to a fault with Hanako, yet curious about everything and everyone. And when I said I missed you while I was with my family, I wasn't lying or exaggerating. The thought of you was never far from my mind, and helped me through that time. That's why I was so confused about what to do when my family summoned me. Even after I had thought I had made my decision, you tried your hardest to challenge me about it. I didn't confess to you out of pity or believing that you were somehow different from what you are. I confessed because I never wanted to lose you, and want you to always be a part of my life, no matter how, what might change. You are a very beautiful person, Isao. Your heart changes none of that. So please, don't apologize for yourself anymore. For a long time, silence reigns in the room. I'm not really sure what this newly born feeling inside of me is, but it pales into insignificance as I wordlessly gaze at Lily's smiling face, warm and gentle as it has always been. It's only as her thumb crosses my cheek, wiping away a single drop of moisture, that I realize this is all I ever wanted. For what it feels like the first time, I give an earnest, wide smile. As Lily feels it against her palm, she returns the gesture. More time passes before either of us has a word, neither of us needing speech to communicate our feelings to each other. I know I can't promise you that I'll always be around, or that we'll be together forever. With some difficulty, I slowly lift my hand, placing it on her pale shoulder. But I think I can at least take you to next year's Tanabata Festival to make up for making you miss this year's. Lily's expression is one of surprise, though I can't say I blame her. You remember that? I've got a pretty good memory. Sometimes. 
She raises her head a little and takes her hand from my cheek, giving a small, amused giggle. I smile absentmindedly at how earnest she is, almost girlish in its lightness. Still smiling warmly, she collects herself and stands upright with the hand resting on my chest. It feels like I'm seeing her for the first time. The sun from the window glowing behind her just as it did when I first walked into that room where she was drinking tea. Very well, then. I shall make it a promise between the both of us to go to the next year's Tanabata Festival together. Even if she can't see me doing so, I nod approvingly. I promise. I promise. Is that it? I think that's it. All right, guys. Woo! That is another one. Down and out. I right, let's see this. I always like seeing these things, the like concepts and stuff. All right, we got some original conceptions. Oh man, alright. Wow, finally after so long we finished this. Whew, man. I gotta say, it's, again, so far, from from what I read um, when I was first, like, a long, long time ago, before I even downloaded the game, when I was first looking into the game and kind of figuring out whether I actually wanted to play it or not, one of the biggest things that I noticed, or one of the things that kind of stuck with me was that somebody had mentioned in one of the reviews that, oh, the only interesting paths are Hanako's and, like, Emmys or something along such lines. Oh, wait, we're not done. Okay, hold on, hold on. We'll, we'll, we'll get into that later. Akira, Lily, and I silently sit on the grassy embankment high above the local town, the breeze gently blowing through the cloudless sky. We may be just a few minutes' walk from town, on a hill just outside its limits, but the view was entirely unexpected. Lily sits behind me, her eyes closed as the gentle breeze flows through her hair. This is a nice area. Yeah, I never knew a place like this was anywhere near Yamaku. And I had to be the one to find it, of course. Akira's grin is genuine, but her tone is slightly different from her usual carefree nature. It's good that you're out of the hospital, though, Isao. Nobody's more glad than I am. I can't stand hospitals. So, you two going back to the school tomorrow? Yep. Akira chuckles in amusement before looking back out the window below. Oh, before looking back out at the town below. The trees between the buildings swaying in the wind. Pity we couldn't go up north for the summer holidays, or get to Tanabata. I wouldn't, Bernie. There's always next time. You'll be graduating before the next summer vacation, won't you? Yeah, there'll still be college after that, mind. Going to the same one? Likely. We both have high enough scores to meet the entry requirements. You sound so sure. Don't worry. You're better than I am in most subjects. I guess it'll work out in due time. That's the way. Just enjoy yourselves in Yamaku while you're there. Lily gives a sad sigh the distinction made between Akira and the two of us. Do you really need to go back to Scotland? Yeah, the folks are already out for my blood as it is. You weren't meant to say this long? She gives a trademark wide grin. Setting my boyfriend up with a passport took some time. You're taking him with you? Just for a while at first. He's a surprisingly worldly guy, so I think he'll just do I think he'll do just fine. Akira gives an amused snort. If our father had his way, I'd have gone a long time ago. I just couldn't pass up an excuse to stay with my favorite little sister in little, a little while longer though. She leans right and gives Lily a tight, playful hug, cheering her up considerably. It's nice to have been with you one last time, though. For what it's worth, I'm in the same boat. <laughs> Thanks, you two. I'll try and come back sometime, don't worry. It's a shame that the business keeps you so busy. The place won't run itself, I'm afraid, and I think it's going to be just the same over there. Considering that, I better get going. Have fun, have fun over there, Akira. <laughs> Will do. With a slight grunt, she lifts herself with her hands and stands up, dusting herself off as she does so. Well, I'd better be off. The plane won't wait for me, after all. 
She has a certain unusual wistfulness in the tone of her voice, her eyes firmly planted on her sister. I'll be okay, Akira. Yeah, I know. Come now, isn't it? It isn't that bad. You'll be able to see us again soon. It is strange to have Lily reassuring a doubtful Akira for once. She really has changed. Goodbye, Akira. Bye. Boom. For a second, the dark cloud figure looks down on them both of us, smiling widely. Perhaps more widely than I've seen her do before. She lets out a long, slightly wavering breath to steady herself before leaving, but eventually slips her hand into her pocket and turns on her heel. And with that, she walks away, one hand held in the air as she goes. See you later, you two! A jazz tune with no beat, melody, or direction to the very end. After a few moments of sitting silently, Lily and I pick ourselves up and dust ourselves off. Turning towards her with a broad smile, I hold out my hand. Shall we be off then? She takes my hand in hers, with a gentle nod, and a smile as beautiful and warm as ever. Indeed we shall, she saw. Oh, sorry. <laughs> as we set off toward the school, that smile, that wonderful smile, engraved itself into my memory. That wonderful smile that we both share. I needed it, I needed it, I needed it. Our past may be scattered and at times overshadowed by sadness, but they're also an irrevocable part of our lives and personalities. Even if I could change a single thing, I wouldn't, because my past was what led me here. That's why, even with all that's happened to us before, and all that may, be, may well befall us, together we'll keep walking forwards. Forwards, towards the future, our future. All righty, guys! Woo! Finally, after fucking forever, we've gotten through Lily's route. And again, let me pick up right where I left off. The thing that I really enjoy about this game, contradictory to a couple of the reviews I saw of it, the paths are all very unique, I would argue. At least these three that I've done so far. I think that the last one that I would need to do would be, um... Shizune's? And I don't know how I don't know how Misha would play into Shizune's uh, little bit there, but yeah, I mean, damn. Because <laughs> again, I, I've already gone over this in Hanako's route, but I'll go over it again just because we're on, it's another finale. But we have Emmy, who again, her whole deal was, yeah, my father died in like a horrific car accident, and I lost my legs because of it. So now I'm kind of like cover all that up with this happy-go-lucky facade and with his house specifically she kind of maneuvered around any questions about it just with sex and i i find emmy's the weirdest and it's so fucking funny because it's like the day after we visit her father's grave and it's like the memorial of his death or like the anniversary of his death and we like go home and fucking bang right and then uh, Rin, I think... Oh, no, there's also Rin. I think that's her name. The armless girl just walks in and just, like, fucking walks in on us banging like that. I don't know. That was just so random and weird to me <laughs> that that's how her route ended. And especially in contrast with, like, M uh, Hanako's and Lily's, where it's, like, Hanako's is, like, this big build-up where, oh, but do I really like her? Oh, does she like me back? Oh, but do I really know her? And, oh, well, I got to focus on myself. And then, like, it's everything swells up and explodes into this final scene where we're like belting out our love for each other, that kind of deal. And then there's Lily's, which is a lot more natural, you know, like, oh, we're introduced to this girl. We kind of take a liking to her. We start dating a little bit, you know, yada, yada, yada. This thing happens. And then we get, you know, our happy little ending. So, so far, each one of these stories has been so drastically unique in both the, um, in both the nature of the relationship and just kind of the chemistry between the characters, which I really, really like. And it's really enjoyable to kind of see how these other characters develop without us. Like with Hanako, for example, we see that even without us, you know, dating her or even without us going down her romance path, we see that she, you know, is able to kind of come out of her shell. She's able to become a little bit more independent and kind of chase after the dreams that she likely wouldn't have been able to chase after beforehand. So that is really amazing. I really, really loved uh, 
Lily's path. And, I mean, yeah, if I had to choose my favorite path out of the three so far, oh, that's so hard. It's such, for me, it's a close tie between Lily and Hanako. But I, I think I'm going to go with Lily. I think I'm going to go with Lily right now. Ah, oh, man, but Hanako's was so fucking good. Oh, I, I can't choose. I can't choose. It's, it's just a tie between those two for now. Oh, man. I, I, I don't want to end this because I feel like I can talk so much about it, but I got to end it here. It's been, like, this recording has been going on forever. And I mean, that I kind of feel like I summed up all my thoughts on it right then and there. Um, But yeah, that's going to be it for this series. Well, for for this part of the series. Um, If you guys want to see me do the other girls' roots. I'm not sure who I would go with next, whether it's Rin or Shizune. I'm not sure who I would do. Probably Rin. I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards Rin a little bit, just because throughout all of these playthroughs, she play, she has, like, had such a minor role in all of them that I'm kind of thinking maybe we go with Rin. But, um, yeah, if you guys want to see me play her route, then leave a like on the video. Tell me in the comment section below that you would like me to see that, or whether you would like to see me play any other games. And, uh, yeah, make sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on post notifications so you'll be notified when a new one of the video comes out. If you guys enjoyed this series or any other videos or series on my channel, then I highly recommend that you hit- wait, no, I already said that. Anyways, yeah, just fuck me. You, you know how the outro goes. I'll see you in the next one.